that everybody can have a masculine and feminine um, style of behavior, but it's on a different core. So if you're a male or a female, there's a different um, core behavior that occurs because of who you are biologically. So in this interview, I'm really being tested in terms of my whole opinion around feminine masculinity and masculine masculinity, or rather a feminine male versus a masculine male. And Pauline has this amazing show called Magical Conversations, where she interviews men around this topic. And this was such an interview. So I thought it was worthy of putting it on my own podcast. So you can hear a little bit about me and my opinion, my personal view around this whole topic. And, and it is topical, of course, because of the whole Me Too movement that is happening in this current age and how opinions are changing. So Pauline's been working in this whole area around masculine and feminine energies and how they can work together for some time. And she has a really great way of articulating and viewing this and how we all need to start having a conversation about it in order to try and understand better where we're at and where others are at. So please consider any comments that I might make. They are not judgments, they're observations. And they may sound like that I'm judging my, my fellow brothers. And in some areas I am, I can't help it. Um, but I also appreciate that this is a changing landscape. Anyway, have a listen, see what you think, and please get in touch with your comments. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hello there. This is Pauline Crawford Omst, and I'm the Ambassador of Magical Conversations. And I'm here today with Michael de Grot, who is in the UK. Um, I'm in California, so we're we're, we're conversing across the, uh, the universe, and I'd like to have a magical conversation with Michael about what is happening for men today. How do you feel about being a man, the man that you are, and about other men? And how does that fit into the world that we are seeing ahead of us? Michael. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to come on your, did you say magical conversations? Magical conversations. <laughs> and well, just... You're a storyteller, yeah. and I, I meant to say that to my listeners, but yes. you're a storyteller, yes. and you have a lovely business called Staying Alive UK, so I'm sure in that you find lots of stories about men. Yeah, there are loads of stories about men, I'm sure. And d just to qualify for our listeners and viewers, that um, I'm, not, I'm not a published author. I don't tell children's stories. Uh, I don't tell any jokes. Uh, but I'm still a storyteller and I help people tell better stories about their businesses so that they can appeal to more people who want to buy from them and become interesting rather than create adverts for their business. So that's my, my kind of background, my business, and that's what I'm doing for now. Let's put it that way. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Magical even. <laughs> uh, definitely magical. Yeah. And I, I do come across a lot of men in my business and particularly I would say at business networking events. And that's where, you know, I'm also a, you know, observer of people, you know, I think everybody likes to observe other people and I like to certainly kind of, I don't even try, but you naturally, you will, unfortunately, because we are human, you, you judge based on what you see, how people speak, how they look. And, you know, unfortunately, I am human and I may, on the odd occasion, come to some conclusions myself. But I, I'm not often these days wrong when I see men who are very much in their masculine 
And uh, I, I totally get that as well, because that's how men are expected to be portrayed, particularly in business, you know, in business, they're all, you know, they've got to have it all sorted. They've got to have a plan and they've got to have a goal. They're on a mission and, you know, <laughs> of achievement. And, you know, so that's very much a kind of masculine trait. Um, I do meet men that may have some, you know, feminine qualities as well. Um, that are a bit more softer spoken and, and perhaps not as assertive stroke aggressive, uh, towards the people that they're speaking to or their audience. So yeah, I do see, you know, fantastic mixture and the rich tapestry of life, I guess. Okay, and, well, but what, when you say these, these very masculine men, is that, um, is that in comparison to you? Do you think that you're more gentle guy that's the way I feel that you come over to me yeah so that's interesting because see I was born a twin and um, my twin is actually my sister and she's five minutes older and I've got two older brothers so I was the youngest and I don't know whether being in the womb with a girl <laughs> made me somehow more feminine than masculine. I don't know. You know, did I get less testosterone when I was in the womb um, or not? I don't know. For instance, people might perceive that my voice is actually quite high. It's not very deep. You know, so I actually believe that my voice never broke. I mean, it's a funny story. When I was younger and my voice was higher, but was it when I was in my early teens, my mother was at the hairdressers and there was an urgent phone call and I needed to get a hold of her for somebody or something. Uh, no mobiles in those days. So I had to mm -hmm. phone the hair salon and ask to speak to my mother. And the, the woman who answered, I've never forgotten it because it made such a huge impact on me and the way I sound when I speak. And the woman turned around to me and said, oh, is, yes, no problem. I'll get Marion for you. Is that her mother speaking? And <laughs> so I was mistaken. And, you know, when you get these um, yeah. scam calls from, uh, let's say, the Far East, uh, where people pretend to be Microsoft. I, I, we get quite a lot of it at home. And I answer them and I engage them in conversation because I record the call to expose them. But it's just a fun thing I do. But I kind of lead them on and, and they're for, for the first few minutes, they call me ma'am. They don't oh. call me sir, they call me ma'am. So over the telephone, I have a very high voice, but my, my, my wife tells me, Claire, that when I speak Dutch, because I'm originally from the Netherlands, when I speak Dutch, my, my voice goes down a few octaves and I actually have a deeper voice. So I've always known that I, I haven't got that, you know, I, my voice never broke, basically. That's how I feel. But I also never, I, I never played football. I never played rugby. Well, there wasn't really that much rugby in Holland, but I never played rugby in this country when I moved over as a teenager. I was never involved in those masculine kind of, you know, team kind of sports with big muscles and stuff like that. I just, I wasn't attracted. So my brothers played football, but I just wasn't interested in football. I never wanted to play football. The only reason I might have wanted to play football is that I would have probably got more attention from my dad because my dad gave much attention to ah, his sons. Yeah. But as far as he's concerned, the twins were like Marion's twins. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so there was an element of that going on perhaps in the background. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to go to a whole childhood kind of <laughs> therapy <laughs> story. No, fascinating. Um, I'm just literally just thinking about that as we're yeah. speaking. Yeah. But um, so for me, um, I wasn't attracted in those masculine side of things. And mm. I always felt I was a little bit different from the other guys. And so then in my working life, believe it or not, I spent most of my time working with women. So I was in the textile industry. Oh. and I had women working for me. So my whole team was women. So I was the manager, and I really got on with women better than I did with the men. 
So in the textile industry, you've got lots of masculine males that, you know, work on the shop floor and yeah. they're kind of, you know, planners and directors and whatever. But I enjoyed working with a team. And then through the whole textile industry, I went into the garment industry and guess what? Designers ended up working for me, you know. And so, and I got on with women because I understood them. I respected them. And they respected me and I treated them well and I treated them with respect. And I noticed <laughs> also how some men did not treat women with respect and I felt helpless. I couldn't do anything. Oh. So, and, and yeah. even at this, you know, when we're speaking now, it's 20 August, 2018, we, you know, we're in the middle of this revolution of the whole kind of gender, gender conversation, whether it be, workplace yeah. recognition or or the me too movement etc and there is inside of me a slight embarrassment about men you know okay. men are being exposed and you know why why are they doing all these things mm. yeah so i you know it's um so for me um you know, it's annoying as well. It's, I almost feel like, oh, these guys, they really need to be punished as well, you know. Oh, really? They, yeah, absolutely. You oh. know, so I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm on the side of the women, you know, getting back at men for doing all these terrible deeds and, and they shouldn't be doing these terrible deeds. No, they should deal, they treat women with respect and, and actually, you know, look within themselves and say, why are they behaving in that way? And I, you know, I do get it because I was just having a conversation with a good friend today, Keith, and said, you know, we're put on this earth to reproduce a lot of it. Yeah. And, you know, men are still a bit like monkeys, <laughs> you know, they, they just want to reproduce, you know, they're forced in that direction very often. And, that means if there's a very high testosterone level, they find it difficult to control these urges. And that's why they treat perhaps women in the way that they do. Well, um, I, who I, knows? Yes, I think you bring up some really interesting points. And I think the, the physicality side, which is reference to what you were saying about your voice and, and the energy of your twin sister or whatever it was, mm. that um, our physicality takes us on a certain path, but the, the other side, the male, um, testosterone-led masculine male, he had a different path. Now, yes. the world was more biased towards, uh, has been and still is biased towards that, that man. And that yes. now we're, we're looking at these, um, all these differences and we're kind of, we're, we're polarizing ourselves like uh, into corners. That's the thing that concerns me because I'm I'm the other reflection of you. So uh, as a as a a young child, I was always a tomboy. Mm. So I was much better climbing the trees and and doing the tough stuff than my sister, who was mm. more of a princess. And I had two brothers, and one was what I'd call a masculine male. One was more a feminine male. And mm. I, my observation now is that in many families, there's always uh, both sides yes so you'll find the tough guy the gentle guy the tough girl the gentle girl the that that mix in any family is always present but we don't right. have a we don't have a dialogue in in which to say oh that's okay so I, mm. your reference to wanting to please your father is fascinating because that that you know if a father is a masculine male and his son is a, a feminine male mm. and, and and nothing to do with sexual variation there's always a challenge that, you know, that the, the father might say, oh, you know, be a man, don't cry. You know, you're my, you're my son. You're my inheriting my status. And it's the same for girls. So I had the reverse. You know, I had the challenge of why wasn't I like all my very feminine female friends and sisters? Mm -hmm. um, was, I, was I an oddity? I had slightly quite a deep voice and um, my, my bone structure was quite square. and. I would stand straight and, and just very different. So as I mm. study that now, it's actually the key. But the issue is whether society and 
uh, all our, our social constructs will listen and understand that that's okay. So yes. one of the things I think we're challenged for, and for you as a man, is how to, how to understand your masculine male brothers and right. persuade them persuade them of a different route um, because they're not all bad. You know, some of them are very wise and it's that wisdom in the world that we want to find. Yes. So that men will respect women at all levels and, and we won't hear these stories that we hear mm. because my concern is that my sisters are, are getting very angry about things which might not necessarily represent all of us. Mm. You know yeah. what I mean? That, that we have to have a conversation. This is the idea with the magical conversation that we understand there are very different types of men and there are very different types of women, but we all share the same world. Well, I, you know, I remember um, going on some training courses. I, I went on very few, but there was one that I remember distinctly, which was around leadership, and they talked about situational leadership. Oh, yes. And situational leadership if I get it right, I've got it right, is that, you know, you adopt your leadership skills to the mm. situation that you find yourself in. And that is if you're in, you know, whether it's building rapport or matching somebody, if they've got a challenging situation or, you know, changing the way you speak or changing the way you give instructions to people or expect to follow up, how you follow up with them. Anyway, a leader has to find many different ways to deal with the variety of people that work for them or they give instructions to. And I liken it a little bit to that. You know, if you're a man, then you should become a situate, well, anybody should be like a yeah. situational leader in terms of saying, you know, if I'm dealing with a female, then you know, I need to know that I'm dealing with a female and I need to make sure that yes. I have respect for their views and respect for everything that they stand for and understand, you know, the energy is different. The, the, the thought process might be different. Likewise, I should have the same empathy or, um, you know, I'm trying to think of the word that I'm century acuity is perhaps a better phrase yeah. around men, you know, too. So if I'm dealing with a boisterous kind of testosterone filled man, you know, I deal with him differently than somebody who's softer and more appreciative and respectful. I don't know. It's so I think there is a different way of dealing with things and, uh, going into the into the right energy and space in how you treat people. Yes, and, and that I, does, yeah, that I, does, I, I know that you, what you mean is that situational, mm. and that's what I think is that we need to uh, we need to be ourselves, but also adjust to our situation, which is that's the challenge, and that you have to be fairly aware of your own being in order mm. to be with other people. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the difficulty, of course, is, is actually knowing where you're at. And I, it wasn't until we met many years ago where you explained the differences between, you know, masculine male, and feminine male, that I even understood where I was at. And it was only that the penny dropped then mm. for myself personally. Yeah, and, because I think, you know, some men don't like being called a feminine minded male. But then that needs to be addressed. It's the same as a masculine-minded woman. So the, the, the use of these words is, is to help us get beyond the stuckness, but not mm. to label, but to understand what you say, the, the energy that's different. That everybody can have a masculine and feminine um, style of behavior, but it's on a different core. So if you're a male or a female, there's a different um, core behavior that occurs because of who you are biologically. Yes. Um, and a lot of people are not aware of that because we've got so tied up in these conversations about gender parity, gender equality, me, to movement, sexual harassment, LBGT, you know, everything, which is all very important that we need to address them. But sometimes we're not understanding the core. 
the difference. You know, no, are you, I get that. Are you a bear or are you a bird? That was my analogy. Remember that that men are more like bears. They could be monkeys, but that the bear is more grounded and and straightforward. Um, the birds are very fluid and they fly everywhere. They dart in and out, and that's mm. generally what women tend to do from their biology. But mm. we know that some women are, if you like, are tougher or fiercer or or more logical. Uh, it's like some men, like you say, are, are softer, are gentle, and that's their absolute born nature. Yes. And the only thing we've got to deal with is somebody else saying, oh, no, you shouldn't be like that. Yeah, now that's, it's, it is interesting because a couple, couple of stories to share with you. So I did some personal development with Tony Robbins and went on, you know, Tony Robbins is a very masculine male mm. and he's got a beautiful wife, Sage, who's very feminine. And when you go on some of his retreats, his courses, etc., they, particularly the one on relationships that they do, um, they very much, you know, Robbins is very good at picking people out of the audience and challenging them on yeah. different situations. And I'm, I'm not talking about the Me Too thing that happened with him, but specifically um, he will identify with women and man, men in the audience and point out to them that they're more masculine or more feminine. And, and when I think back, when he used to do that, it was very much like, it's wrong that you, you know, but it was maybe highlighting women at times to say, oh, you're very masculine, you know, you need to be softer and you need to embrace your feminine energy and, you, you know, you should be dressing differently and you should be wearing pink. And, and he kind of softens them and they, and they do change, you know, yeah. uh, in front of your eyes into more feminine kind of person. So that confused me a bit when that happened. But I also have challenges sometimes that, and I think this is a story I told you about when I was in a pub at a networking event and I was walking out of the pub going home and there were three masculine males that I, d I identified they were, you know, drinking some pints of beer and they were blocking the door for me to get out. And I just said, excuse me, can I get through to one guy who had his back to me? And they treated me like I was, oh, this is a horrible thing to say. They, I suppose their energy was masculine. My energy might have been a bit feminine. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I just respectfully asked whether I could get through politely. And they kind of... Um, it wasn't banter at the same level, you know, it was kind of talking down at me a little bit. And I felt like I couldn't walk fast enough to get away from them yeah. because I did not relate to them at all. I was not on their level. Mm. I mean, first of all, I don't drink alcohol anymore and I haven't for like 15 years. But so meeting people that are intoxicated I haven't got an issue for it. And I don't judge people because they drink alcohol, but they were clearly intoxicated. And then their behavior towards me was, oh, I'm getting out of here, you know, get away from them as quick as you can. Yeah. And I thought that was really a telling kind of episode, really. <laughs> well, absolutely. And, and you, you, you know, probably feeling that um, they were treating you like they might treat a woman. That's right. Yeah. That's how I felt. Yes, that's how I felt. Yes. I felt I was a woman being not, not just being spoken to as if, but it's a terrible thing to say because that means I'm, I'm saying that men talk to women in a certain way and they totally do. I do. And, and of course, you know, women vary as well. And there are different, different mm. energies, especially when intoxicated and all that sort of thing. Sure. But I think it's a, a lot. It says a lot for our, uh, unawareness in the world that you know mm. if if the, the cure for all this is to know yourself better the challenge for me is why do people not want to know themselves better mm. um, but you know that, that's the journey that we're on in helping other people to develop their stories uh, to mm. develop their awareness of for well, me gender dynamics and also the idea of of 
having a, a magical conversation that you respect every single body that happens to be in the room with you, but you allow them to be different. Yes. Um, I think that our differences are really important, but we seem to have this struggle in the world about saying, well, we should all be equal. Mm. Um, and I know that Tony Robbins now talks about masculine and feminine uh, energy within each of us. Mm. But it's, it's quite a challenge to get to understand unless you really uh, get inside somebody else's mindset and heart and their shoes, as people say, walk, walk in another person's shoes. Yes. And I think that the Me Too movement, which was important, I saw recently a hashtag which was men to, M-E-N-T-O-O, -O, so that there's a sort of a backlash from digging up the issues as to people rushing to their corners. But we need to come back into the centre and have a conversation about it. Yes. And, and tell the story about the kind of world that we would like to have. Uh, and that, for me, I think is, is where the storytelling comes in. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's possible, that we can actually create a, a tribe that has stories about togetherness? You know, it would be awesome and amazing. And I think there is this, there's room for it, there is space for it, for sure. I think at the moment where we're at, we have to get through this phase where we are pointing the finger uh, at the moment, because I think that's where we're at at the moment. Yes, so Me Too is pointing the finger, Men Too is pointing the finger. Mm. And once we can get through that, there has to be an element of that. I, I think it's a phase we have to get through. When the workplace is fairer, and I have seen it, you know, I, I can't mention any names, but when I was in the textile industry, and I, I feel awful now looking back that I witnessed it and was helpless to do anything. But the top senior guy in the business um, had blatant relationships, affairs with the, his workers, female workers, for everyone to see. Mm. And and treated them appallingly, you know, and so I know that these things have gone on in the workplace. They are probably still going on in the workplace where women are treated very badly. I do know that people's voice, uh, women's voices, aren't necessarily heard in the workplace. Mm. Yeah, and until we can get better equality in the workplace, and men wake up because. You know, in the big corporates, it's still very testosterone-filled organizations. Now, I know also that includes women who have believe they have to, apart from ones that are naturally masculine, but, mm. you know, they all feel that they need to behave like the men in order to belong and, and have a voice. You know, they need to become more masculine in yeah. order to get a voice in the boardroom table. So, and... And men don't yeah. often understand that there is balance. You know, you need to have women who actually have more empathy than men in the boardroom. And you need to have a balance of that. Otherwise, you're going to have an organization that's not going to have that empathy, let alone for the teams that are working in the organization. More importantly, for the communities and the customers they serve. Um, I so, so anyway. Agree. Yeah, I so agree. So, that's, so, that's so that really part important. of it has to happen. Yeah. Stopping pointing the finger when that phase is out. And then I think people will start to listen. And hopefully your work will, will facilitate that discussion. And for having the roundtable storytelling discussions where we can share some stories about our journey through life and our perception of masculine and feminine energies yeah. and how it affects us. That's beautifully put. And definitely a magical conversation. So, so Michael, just to, to come to the end of this wonderful interview, um, what, what advice would you like to share with men? That, you know, just maybe one piece of advice to your fellow uh, testosterone-led brothers. Yes, brothers. Here's the message for you. Um, us, us men wear a mask, right? And that mask, the mask, hides a lot of things behind it 
it's time to melt the mask. Um, now, I heard not that phrase, but I heard that a, a guy who's quite famous in America, if not the world, Lewis House, wrote a book oh, about yes. Yes. the men's mask. And I've, n- I've not read the book, but I can well imagine what he's talking about. Because when I heard the concept, I went, totally true. Yeah. You know, men do wear masks. So men, melt your mask, open up, start having a conversation. That's excellent. Now, one piece of advice for women into how to understand their men. Help men melt their masks. <laughs> you know, they are best placed to be able to do that because whether their energy is softer so yeah. they can support their men to melt their mask in a way that men could never do for each other. Yeah. And so I think women have a massive role to play to help men melt their mask instead of pointing the finger at men because it hurts us, you know, that we are yes. all point because when you point your finger at men you're pointing at all of us and we're not all bad yeah yeah, absolutely and we're not all good you know (laughs) we're all different flavors and therefore don't put us all in one bucket but i think men have got a mask you you see so many of them in the press in the media on tv now social media you know on twitter and so yeah that's it that's fantastic advice so for our listeners who are watching Take on that board, that advice. Thank you so much for your time, Michael. My the pleasure. Thank you. The UK, I love you, darling. You have a wonderful day, and we'll hope that our listeners will listen and, and hear the stories. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 